Okay, welcome. Um, welcome to the uh, Fordham Institute. Uh, welcome to David Driscoll and the Massachusetts Miracle. Um, one of the uh, better things that happened at Fordham in my time here, which is a long time now, uh, was when David agreed to go on the board of Fordham, uh, and then in due course became chairman of our board. So we are, we are supposed to sort of behave in his presence on grounds that uh, he's in a... Since when? <laughs> <laughs> grounds that he's in a position of authority, um, which indeed he is, uh, but doesn't mean we always behave. Um, though uh, uh, I'm sure the Fordham staff in the back of the room will, will wave at me if I do anything utterly inappropriate. Uh, this is a, a, and let me say, because I know at least a few people, uh, including some Maryland people, friends of mine, are watching. Uh, let me say to the uh, non-studio audience, um, the, the rest of the world that might be looking, welcome to you. And if you want to send in comments or later questions, which we don't promise to answer, uh, the, the, it's hashtag M-A Miracle, uh, and the handle is Education Gadfly. Uh, so uh, feel free to uh, uh, contribute if you like. Uh, th th David's book, which I think is terrific, uh, recounts a story that I think is terrific. Uh, and it's a story that I think uh, the country and its other states do well to uh, learn. Uh, and uh, it's particularly vivid for me um, as now being punished by membership on the, Mas on the Maryland State Board of Education uh, that um, we are trying to do some of the things they did in Massachusetts and finding it not an easy thing to do. Uh, and I, I think that we'll get into some of the reasons for that. But let me, let me welcome you all. Let me welcome... Uh, David, let me welcome a very distinguished panel that's sort of uh, vaguely reminiscent of the comment attributed to John F. Kennedy when he found himself in a room full of Nobel Prize winners. Uh, he said something like, this is the most distinguished gathering since Thomas Jefferson dined alone. <laughs> uh, we have a very distinguished gathering up here, and um, I think you can read their bios in the, in the handout, so I'm not going to try very hard, um, except to say that uh, that uh, three of the four actually participated in one way or another in the story uh, that we are about to hear. Um, and uh, and uh, Bill Bouchaw is here from the National Assessment Governing Board to keep us all honest because he's the keeper of the evidence uh, as to whether the Massachusetts miracle really did or didn't occur uh, <laughs> since it's uh, NAEP data and, uh, P as well as PISA data and other external um, uh, metrics like that that everybody uses in talking about uh, the success story of Massachusetts education reform, which is a long story. We're talking 20 plus years here. Um, and uh, a, a, a really nicely written and thoroughly manage, manageable book, actually a length that you can contemplate reading over the weekend, um, and which isn't true of t far too many education books. So uh, first of all, David, thank you for for uh, writing it and, uh, for, and for joining us today. Our format, as often at uh, Fordham events, is uh, basically, from the get-go, going to be Q&A, not, not, not speech-making. Um, I, I, I gave David and the panelists a few questions in advance so that they can um, be ready with their sort of mini-speeches. Um, but let me, uh, uh, let me first go, as I should, to David with a, with a few of these. Um, and, um, and let me start by saying you're obviously both an education leader and a, and a political strategist. Uh, uh, what is it in your own background, your own temperament, your own previous experience that uh, prepared you uh, to succeed in the roles you played in the Massachusetts story, particularly between 1993 and 2007, which is a 14-year span, uh, a, a longer than almost anybody has in any leadership or in any state these days. Um, what? Uh, uh, what in your own life story or genes, um, chromosomes, made this possible for you? Well, first of all, th I want to thank you and Mike Petrilli and Fordham. Uh, I guess I have to thank you for uh, recounting that the book isn't that deep. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, that long. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, welcome to many of my friends here in the audience, and, and uh, uh, particularly, I, I, I don't want to single out too many, but uh, uh, certainly Jeff Nelhouse, who led our assessment, and I, I give him way too much credit in the book as it is, 
um, <laughs> but he was terrific. And uh, um, uh, Gary Maynor, uh, our old friend, my, my wife is, uh, I want to say hello to her. She's trying to work the computer to, to watch, and I hope <laughs> she does. Uh, so thank you, uh, Chuck. As you know, uh, you don't get rich writing education books. So For the, sure. The issue is to have forums and, and have the discussion, and, and hopefully many of the uh, things that we did in Massachusetts, good and bad, uh, can be debated and, and used. And it's interesting, you asked the question, you know, what, what, did, I, what did I bring to it? Uh, you know, when you write a book, particularly as you did, uh, autobiography, and I start, uh, you know, you, you start to reflect on all of it. There's been as, uh, a number of studies about heredity versus too many studies, too useless about heredity versus environment. But, uh, I mean, all of the things that we are growing up and our experiences uh, help us. And in my case, being the youngest of ten in a large Irish family that had no money, but we were going to college anyway. Uh, you learn hard work. You learn all those those kinds of great uh, lessons from your mother and father, and in my case, six older sisters and three older brothers. <laughs> um, so with respect to education, a couple of things. First of all, I was uh, an outsider, at least from my perspective, because I was a math major, and I was, you, you'll read in the book, I was a math major, I was going to be rich. I was certainly not going <coughs> to teach. You can't get rich in teaching. <laughs> and I wound up falling in love with teaching because a priest came and uh, recruited me uh, as I was uh, on the mound with my kids in the playground. And, and, I, and I enjoyed teaching and went into it. But I, but I didn't go through the usual education pathway. And I think that helped because everyone that went through the tradition, I, I think they, when you get your teaching certificate, if you go through a usual program, uh, there's a certain amount of uh, indoctrination that uh, seems to happen. And you, you get a badge that allows you to, to accept the logic. Uh, and I didn't quite have that badge. So I was at a middle school, <coughs> junior high school in Somerville, three junior high schools. And I was teaching ninth grade uh, algebra to the top group. And they separated the kids out by ability, 3A through 3I, by the way. 3I destined <coughs> to drop out. <coughs> and uh, in the three junior high schools, we used three different math books. And only one of the three used the same series as used in the high school, 10 through 12. Mm. So I think one of the things that, that I brought was, a, was an outsider's view of this illogic that caused me to say, hey, wait a minute. I, I, I'm not going to live with this. And everybody said, please, just have another donut and don't worry about it. And I'd say, no, no, I'm going to worry about it. I mean, I, I'm going to worry about it. Uh, and so I organized the faculty in Somerville in the second year. Um, and we made all kinds of logical recommendations, most of which were ignored. So that's, that's one thing you bring. Um, I, I wound up in my own home district as a teacher and then as an administrator. And uh, if, if nothing else, I learned to have a thick skin. Because you, you, grow, you grow up with people, you think you like them, they like you, you know them. And then you do something like close a school, and all of a sudden they're your worst enemy. Mm -hmm. And they're not talking to you or whatever. So you learn to get a thick skin, and you better have a thick skin as you as you progress through this business. The other thing I noticed uh, as I went through that I think helped me was that um, the next level, at the next level, I, I was never particularly intimidated by the incumbents that are there. Uh, I thought that I could do as le at least as good a job uh, with the illogic as they were doing. And so uh, I think that, that helped me. I tell the story in the book about as a young math teacher being uh, our superintendent, new superintendent, decided to bring in experts from Harvard because he was, he was thinking the math program, the math teachers weren't doing the job. And so th they came in. And, and I taught this class, and I was uh, given very low marks. And I have to tell you, you know, you'll have to read the book, it's maybe the best class I ever taught. <coughs> and I was knocked down for the silliest of reasons. So uh, I even learned not to be intimidated by Harvard. Uh, <laughs> so, so I, I think that that, that helped. But so I, I think as as we went up through it, you know, the political wars and having the thick skin, I, I summarize it this way, which puts me a, a little bit in a unique position. I think I am not one of those people inside the system that con continues to defend the system. 
say we're fine, everything's fine. I mean, it's not fine. I mean, we go to school from September to June as if kids still work on farms. Uh, kids today, and for the last uh, several decades, report that, high school kids, that while they don't like clicks and they don't like the food and they have other problems, the number one complaint of high school kids in America, they're bored and they see no connection between what they're learning and what they're going to need in life. And that hasn't changed. So I don't know how you can defend the system when, when those things occur. On the other hand, for those people outside the system that think it's awful, they keep talking about how our achievement is flat, uh, while the cost goes up, now you've got to cut that in half and cut it in half again, too. There are great things going on in our public schools everywhere. You can go out and I, you name a school, and I'll take you there, and I will show you teachers that are terrific and things that are going on that are great. So I've always been in that middle world, and I think I'm, sometimes I feel like I'm alone there, uh, where I don't defend the system, but I don't totally bash it either. Let me give you one last point mm -hmm. on that. Uh, people use, and Bill will tell you this, long-term NAEP, which is nine-year-olds and 13-year-olds, not fourth and eighth graders, nine-year-olds, 13-year-olds. We've been testing nine-year-olds and 13-year-olds in America in math and reading since the 70s, early 70s. That's called long-term NAEP. And so it's, <coughs> it's pure. And the results are flat as a pancake. However, Simpson's paradox, the subgroups have changed dramatically. There's many more... Hispanic kids now, many more uh, uh, English language learning kids, etc. So whites are actually performing better than they ever did. Uh, all subgroups are performing better than they did. It's just when you put the average out, it comes down. So actually achievement in America, one could say, is going up. So check I think those are the things that uh, I think I brought with me to the, to the dance. Or the fight. I'm intimidated, insider, outsider, uh, um, uh, thick skin, a few other, I think, important uh, features here. Uh, if, if folks in the back who think they're having trouble hearing David want to bring up a handheld mic, uh, because he's speaking at his normal voice, uh, maybe you can amplify him uh, better that way. Um, a couple people said they were craning their ears, and uh, let's see if they can get you a better mic. Uh, anyway, while they are doing that, uh, I want to go to the, the, the elements of the Massachusetts miracle itself. This is often described as a grand bargain. Um, and uh, it's, incidentally, that's the phrase we're using at the uh, Maryland Commission on Innovation and Funding uh, to see whether we're capable of creating a grand bargain. Um, so far, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, Massachusetts people talk about it that way. And, um, and in your book, there's a, a list of the to-dos that came out of the grand bargain. It is a long and intimidating list of moving parts after you, after you sort of made the bargain. Um, the, uh, it, I'm going I'm to quote a few sentences from page 95, if you're interested. Uh, at the department, we decided we had to both keep faith with the legislative intent and develop regulations that made sense to the majority of schools and districts. Over the next couple of years, we would need to, now listen to this, create curriculum frameworks, develop a student testing system to include a graduation score, monitor the complex funding formula, open new charter schools, define learning time in the daily school schedule, test new teachers, recertify veteran teachers, and create a measurable accountability system for both schools and districts. That's all they had to do uh, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the to-do list that emerged on the uh, sort, of, sort of action side of the grand bargain. Um, but, uh, but what's the grand bargain? How'd you get there? What, 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 did, what was the bargain itself? OK, is this better, I hope? Thank you. And uh, uh, I want to recognize Roberto Rodriguez that just came in the room because he was uh, Ted Kennedy's key education advisor when I began and was tremendously helpful. So welcome. Now uh, running Teach Plus. Uh, so the grand bargain was, was really struck by the business community that said to the system, look, we're going to give you the tools, including money, $2 billion over seven years, by the way. Uh, but we're going to hold you accountable. So that was the, that was the grand bargain. And everyone, everyone, as Jack Rennie, who led it, used to say, everybody's going to have to drink a little castor oil. Uh, and that, that, that was true. So, so there were charter schools, but they were capped. There was uh, uh, principals were able to choose their own staff. 
but they lost uh, the ability to have tenure. School committees uh, lost the ability to uh, d uh, to hire people. There were more school committee meetings that lasted till three in the morning to decide who the new basketball coach was going to be. That was taken you away did from them. Patronage? Uh, not patronage. It's nonsense. Right. But anyway, <laughs> um, so that was the grand bargain. We're, we're going to give you the tools, but we're going to hold you accountable. When it came to uh, looking at this very comprehensive law that had all kinds of pieces to it, put together by first of all the business community in a great logical way, but then amended by various legislators to put their favorite thing in. Uh, it was difficult for us at the department to figure out what were the important things. And, and that list on page 95 is the important things based on what we came up with as what I call the three buckets. Our law, in my judgment, fundamentally came down to higher standards and expectations for kids. And there, of course, we were going to test the kids, and they were going to have to pass a test uh, to, to get a high school diploma. Higher standards and expectations for educators, and there... Uh, we not only instituted a new teacher test, which was new, and the reason I became commissioner, by the way, uh, but also uh, teachers were going to have to recertify. In Massachusetts, if you had a license, you never had to do anything uh, ever again. I mean, most of them took courses because you get paid more for masters, but anyways. And then higher standards and expectations for schools and districts, which was, uh, that's when Susan uh, Scofani, who's here, came from Houston to show us the Texas system. And we adopted AYP before No Child Left Behind. Our uh, version of No Child Left Behind was far superior to the feds, by the way. Uh, and they're not better than Texas's. And it, well, it was out to 2000. That's true. And it, worked, it was out to 2020. So, so that, those were the, the main elements. Uh, but all the time we were doing this, uh, there was the expectation that we were going to get results because we were given the tools. And $2 billion represented what kind of an increase in funding in Massachusetts well, at that it, point in time? It, pro it probably was Roughly. probably less than 10%. Less than 10. Because most, most of it comes from the locals. But most of that money went to the poor districts. It was to bring everybody up to foundation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, th that was the bulk of the money. Uh, people ask me, including uh, Checker Finn, uh, can you point to uh, what the money did? And um, I, I don't think I can. I mean, I think it, it made a big difference in the fact that the poor districts were able to hire staff, uh, reduce class sizes with 30 and 35, and, and kindergartens and basements and all that kind of thing. So it was very helpful in that regard. But I would say it was fi you, you, you couldn't find places where they said, oh, yeah, now we have the money, we're going to get student achievement up. I think that had more to do with MCAS and the requirement. But, um, but it did send a very, very important message, and this is a, a good message for Maryland, and that is they kept faith with what they said they were going to do. We had a governor, a, a Republican conservative governor, who came into office and said, I'm going to um, balance the budget, even though he's supposed to have a balanced budget. He, he, uh, he inherited a, a deficit from Governor Dukakis, who was running for president. Uh, a wonderful governor, by the way. Uh, so, so this conservative uh, Republican, who was not going to raise taxes, committed to the $2 billion over seven years. Even though it was subject to annual appropriation, they stuck with it. And uh, I, th I think that's one of the great lessons. So the money was about the commitment, and therefore you weren't off the hook. Usually, they say, well, we're going to do this, and you better raise standards, and then they don't do it, and so you don't raise standards. So talk about the stick to aspect of this, the, the durability side of this. Uh, I mean, as you know, we at Fordham spent a lot of time and effort in Ohio, and just last year, the uh, state board and the legislature wimped out on the graduation requirement that the state had put in place for fear that too many kids would fail it. Uh, and many states have uh, either deferred, delayed, wimped out, uh, re retreated, altered, uh, given up on the exam approach altogether. Um, what, uh, what produced 20 years, really, of, of, of kind of continuity with this um, fairly bold package in Massachusetts? And I think the answer is the uh, political leadership of Massachusetts. Uh, we'll take some credit because we stood tr strong as well, 
but it was easy for us. It was the elected officials, the governors, and that, that meant three governors. Three in a governor, row? Well, it actually was more than that, but I mean, the, up, in, up until the point where we actually instituted the graduation requirement, mm. which was the biggest threat to our law, when laws were filed, a lot of legislators were getting uh, cold feet. A lot of superintendents were saying this isn't going to work. A lot of principals said it's not right for kids. I mean, as I'd say, I get burned in effigy. It doesn't hurt. Uh, but but it's just <laughs> tremendous. Uh, <coughs> that is a joke, by the way. I mean, <laughs> uh, so at that point, uh, governors, uh, s speakers of the House, Senate presidents, and they were all different, uh, stuck with it. And I think that was the key. And, they, and it's been to this day, although the, the foundation budget went away, but the sticking to high standards has been a hallmark for the political leadership in Massachusetts and great credit to them and the boards, um, et cetera. So I think the political leadership, in the book I talk about Jane Swift, uh, who was governor at the time of the institution of the graduation requirement, used to say, everybody's waiting for me or Driscoll to blink, and I'm not blinking. Uh, and so I didn't either. During most of this time, if I'm not mistaken, it it, they were Republican governors and Democratic uh, legislatures, weren't they? That is correct. So bipartisan actually worked? Bipartisan actually worked. It's hard to imagine. It certainly is today. <laughs> so what didn't work? Uh, the what. Uh, uh, you allude in the book to continuing achievement gaps. Uh, what did you uh, hope that this miracle was going to do that it hasn't done to your satisfaction? Yeah, so, so, so I, you know, the, the good news about the gaps, of course, is that all boats rose. So that's a good thing. So, Simpson's paradox again. Yeah. So, but, but it, it didn't really close that much. Uh, we had some pockets of it, particularly early on. Um, I think uh, there are a lot of things that uh, there are a lot of things that uh, are left uh, uh, that have we've not made progress on that that we more or less promised. One was in early childhood education. Certainly, the report that led to our law, "Every Child a Winner," that was done by the business community, called on the Commonwealth to put uh, a lot more resources into early childhood education. That was kind of the promise of the law. Uh, there was actually a promise to give the department more money. That never happened, Jeff, either, did it? <laughs> um, but uh, we, haven't re we really haven't done uh, much in uh, early childhood education, in my judgment, uh, of any significance except give it lip service. We have a, a very active advocacy group locally, and every year they come out in the fall and list all these legislators that sign on to the promise <coughs> of early childhood. Then when the budget comes out, there's, there's no new money. So that's one area. Uh, I, I'm con uh, concerned, as Jim knows, uh, a little bit of a dog of the bone about this. Uh, you? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be concerned. We're not very, very different statistically than any other state in the area of kids needing remediation uh, going on at community colleges. I think it's a disgrace. And so we've done a great job getting them up over the uh, uh, minimum graduation requirement, which is pretty minimum, by the way. Uh, I think we've done a, a very nice job with a lot of suburban districts and so forth. They've taken MCAS seriously to the next level, so they're at the proficient and advanced levels, and our college uh, students, uh, uh, they, ma they matriculate to college and they stay, and so that's good. But this group in the middle, these kids who pass MCAS but, but really don't get to proficient by the time they're at the end of high school, they are not able to pass uh, what is, in our case, Accuplace or other states' compass, but it's pretty reasonable test. And so that's a big problem, uh, Checker, in, in my opinion. So I was going to finish with you before turning to Jim, but the next question obviously belongs to both of you. To be clear, Massachusetts' uh, lofty MCAS expectation was not equivalent to college ready, and still is not. Am I correct? Well, uh, you're mixing two things. All right. And I, and I Clarify. So and then Jim gets to explain what they're going to do about it. So I think there, I think there are two levels, and I was very uh, clear about this. I think there are two levels. Our graduation required to graduate from high school. Business said to us, "Look, these kids are graduating from high school. You're giving them diplomas. They can't. They can't do basic math, and they can't really write paragraphs." So we set up what I would call a floor, which was basic with four levels, and basic 
was the graduation requirement, the thing that said, okay, you, you deserve a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. It's hardly a rose garden. It's just a high school diploma. In fact, it's about an eighth grade standard at the 10th grade level. College ready is quite different than that, and I don't think we should be promising uh, that every kid has to get a high school diploma to, uh, has to be college ready. Uh, there, I believe, and Bill uh, didn't go through this war, but when I was chair of NAGBE, I couldn't get the board to vote it, but I'm going to tell you, NAEP proficiency in reading and math is as good a measure of college readiness as exists in this country. We did studies in Florida and other places. So you can take it to the bank based on Dave Driscoll. Don't worry about research studies or whatever. I'll show you the statistics in every darn state. You look at the number of kids who are able to get into college. You look at the number of kids proficient, if that's what they're using, or look at their proficiency on NAEP, which is uh, true. So that's why, uh, Checker, now uh, a previous chair or, or a subsequent chair to, to Jim Pizer, the chair of the board, Chris Anderson, who came under, uh, we went back to a Democrat uh, quick, uh, for a short time, uh, Governor Patrick for eight years, now we're back to Charlie Baker, uh, the uh, Republican. Uh, the, uh, Chris wanted to make the graduation requirement proficient. So we came up with the following compromise. Uh, we leave the graduation alone as a basic. Any kid who passes MCAS has to try and become proficient before they leave high school. And the high school has to do everything it can to get as many kids to proficient as possible. In fact, they were required to put them on proficiency plans, and the kids had to keep taking the test. Even though they passed it for the, for the diploma, they had to take it again to try and get mm. to proficient. I, I don't think it's had the kind of teeth that it should have. Jeff, well, you and I were still there at Wood, I think. But um, anyway, it's because we created it. But um, so that, that's the difference, Chuck. So, Jim, is that situation uh, permanent in Massachusetts? Uh, well, first of all, I, one correction. Um, the, uh, the proficiency standard was like my last act as, uh, as, as board chair. I actually got an extension of my term from Mitt Romney so I could be there for that. Um, so. Uh, you can blame me, I guess, if that's the right word. But no, I think actually um, the idea of putting it proficient, putting it proficiency was exactly on this point of trying to send the signal that the, uh, the needs improvement or the basic standard was not good enough for college and that we were trying to ratchet this up. Actually, Checker, I don't, you probably don't remember, but uh, when we were trying to figure out where originally to set the threshold for passing, you and I had lunch uh, in Boston, mm -hmm. and I asked you, so, you know, should it be – Proficient should it be needs improvement should it be somewhere in between because we were you know concerned about getting getting it right, um, and you said very clearly I think well you know not failing sounds like passing to me so maybe that's where you ought to put it so I think you're responsible for our low for our low standards. <laughs> um, Touche. <laughs> but, um, but but I will say I mean the the um, what we saw when we initially set the standard was it was very challenging for a lot of students and the and the passing rates based on that standard were originally somewhere in the two-thirds area. And that's, you know, potentially a third of your students not graduating from high school is a pretty scary thing, politically and otherwise. Uh, and I think it was a reflection of the courage of the political establishment, including Jane Swift, as you mentioned, Dave, uh, as well as Dave and his team, to stick with it um, even at the needs improvement level, the sort of just above failing. Uh, moving it to proficiency, had we done that, I think would have uh, given us some different results. but. Uh, in, in terms of pushing the field maybe a little bit higher and faster. But right now, we're seeing 80 to 90 percent proficiency rates on our 10th grade exam. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we've kind of gone back and, re and are in the process of refreshing our assessment in order to ensure that we're establishing a standard that's meaningful and that is maybe not necessarily the college-ready standard since it is a 10th grade test, but is moving us uh, closer to that direction. Okay, for the moment anyway. Uh, thank you. Uh, back to you, uh, Dave Driscoll. One of the odder images in your book is you talk about yourself and your predecessor, Bob Antonucci, as safe crackers. Um, as, um, can you explain how safe cracking relates to education reform? So it's interesting. I actually wanted the book called The Safe Cracker. The publisher wouldn't hear of it. The publisher said, you, you got to be kidding me. They, they, half the uh, population doesn't know what you're talking about. I said, what do you mean? And I checked it out with my nieces and others 
And sure enough, they don't know what I was talking about because they're all <laughs> digital, they are digital safe crackers. But in the old days, for those of you that remember, hold up your mic <laughs> again if you don't mind. Oh, I'm sorry. For those of you that remember, they, they used to come with a dial and you'd have to turn it one way and then turn it the other and you have to get it just right. And when you, if you went too far, you missed it and turn it back. So it's that calibration that I, that I was referring to for Bob Antonucci and I. Uh, as we were implementing the law, uh, sometimes you can get just too heavy on the compliance. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it just becomes bureaucratic and, and everybody yeses you to death, but they don't do it. And then um, at other times, you know, they, they want to get out from under the requirements. So it's that, it's that issue of making sure that you're checking in with the field to see where that sweet spot is, if you will, as you're implementing things. And I think uh, Bob and I did that extremely well, and uh, I think it was a, a big part of our success, frankly. I, 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 I say in the book, we made a commitment. We're both superintendents at, at the local level. We made a commitment then any superintendent that called us would get a call back within 24 hours from one of us. You've got how many districts in Massachusetts? Oh, uh, too many. 351. Uh, uh, towns, more districts. Now, they didn't call every day, you know. I mean, <laughs> some were smart enough never to call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, we never missed. I mean, I don't care if he was traveling or whatever. Uh, we always got back. And I, and I think that, that did have a lot to do. They weren't happy, <laughs> believe me. Uh, with us all the time, but at least they knew that we were in communication and, and trying to make it uh, as best, uh, as, as practical as and as workable as possible. So this is Washington. <coughs> um, did f I have to ask, did federal policy play any significant role, for good or ill, uh, in, your, in your work in Massachusetts? Well, I, I actually think it did, because No Child Left Behind came along uh, and uh, what did uh, uh, we had been we had been going and you were deep into this before No Child Left Behind got enacted, uh, right? But it did require us. We got doubled our testing, by the way. Thank you, Feds. But um, we were three five seven in reading, four six eight in math. I, I think No Child Left Behind really was initially uh, a big a big help to us. It supported our work. Um, it um, it got us uh, on the same page as everybody else. Everybody was sort of coming our way. So I think there, uh, it, it was helpful. I, I mentioned that I think the, the two big flaws with No Child Left Behind. One was if, you, if you're going to get half wet in the shower, you might as well get wet. They, in my judgment, they should have required states to set high standards. They left it to states, and that's why people call it the race to the bottom. I mean, you had one state that claimed that 88% of their kids were proficient in fourth grade math. The truth was under NAEP that 12% were, and I won't mention the state, but... It's not in the Northeast. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so that was one flaw, I think. And then the other was, as I mentioned, this 2000 and whatever it was, 14, 15, 17, whatever it was, uh, for the end point of the, of the uh, everybody proficient, which is only a goal. Uh, had they done it as we did in a lot more gradual way, uh, then people could actually make AYP. AYP worked extremely well in Massachusetts. So. I think the feds uh, have a role. I mean, I know we go one way or the other, so we go now to ESSA, which I say in the book is like giving the keys back to the driver that caused the accident in the first place. So I'm not opposed to federal uh, uh, requirements that are, that are reasonable. In fact, um, as, as you know, Checker, uh, uh, Mark Tucker was quite concerned and wrote about the fact that uh, at a CCSSO meeting a year ago, everybody was talking about ESSA, and he was so excited about that. He said, that's great. Here the chiefs are really recognizing now that they have this ability and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then when he read the minutes, he realized it was all about compliance. Mm -hmm. And here they are being given the, the authority to do uh, some things. So, so I, I'm not for that kind of, uh, you know, total top-down, but I think there is a role to play. And I, and, and I wouldn't say, uh, I mean, I thought, I thought that the Bush administration and, uh, and uh, Secretary Page's uh, administration tried very hard to work with us to make it work. And, uh, you know, there were, some, there were some parts of the law that were, were difficult to navigate, getting the results back in time to have parents take choice and so forth. But, um, so I think they work well with us. I think there's a, there's a role 
uh, for the federal government. I think they're right w around issues of, uh, of discrimination, et cetera, that to keep our... Uh, but you were launched in Massachusetts before all that. I, I agree. Okay. Um, and they didn't get in your way except by increasing the testing burden? I mean, in terms of what you were, how you were going about it in Massachusetts? That's right. I, they, didn't, they really didn't get I mean, we really worked. I mean, let, let's, let's, let's face the political facts. Uh, George Bush got No Child Left Behind with four key legislators, two senators and two representatives. One of those senators was Senator Ted Kennedy. So if you were looking for a fight between the Bush administration and the Department of Education in Massachusetts with Ted Kennedy, you hit the wrong, you hit the wrong state. Uh, we were we vowed to work together. Roberto uh, was a great example of that. So we worked very well with the feds. In, in answer to your question, I, I don't think the feds, I mean, except for complying with No Child Left Behind, we had plenty of work to do on our own without uh, whether the feds were there or not. Okay, uh, this being Fordham, I have to ask you whether the, the choice piece, the charter school piece in the grand bargain was important. Well, here again, it was a part of it, and it was probably uh, relatively watered down in the sense that charter schools were capped, and uh, ch uh, choice, choice is there, it's still options, an option, but it's pretty lukewarm, as you know, in Massachusetts, and, and I don't think we'd ever have vouchers, and unfortunately, the people in Massachusetts just voted not to raise the cap uh, when the charter school advocates couldn't get it done through the legislature. They tried to do it by referendum. And it looked as if they had the facts on their side. Our charter schools in Massachusetts are doing extremely well, uh, some of the best charter schools in the country. Uh, but, but it became a political war about the public schools versus charter. And uh, <coughs> the unions uh, prevailed. And but when uh, you said lukewarm, it was a quantitative statement, not a qualitative statement. Absolutely. L lukewarm in the policies and statutes of, of the Education Reform Act of 1993. It was a Republican governor uh, who, who pushed for those issues. The great majority of the Democratic legislators had to, had to be drag kicking and screaming <laughs> to go against the unions on those issues. So our, our choice in charter was pretty tepid. But produced some good schools. Absolutely. Okay, and lastly, before I get, get to the panel some more, um, you, uh, you read very fondly and appreciatively of allies and deputies and mentors <coughs> and people like Jeff and people like Antonucci, um, but you're also pretty blunt about people you had some, some, some shall we say, issues with. Um, especially vivid in, in, is your discussion of, 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 of the late John Silver. Um, how does a former math teacher navigate these waters um, with, uh, with uh, powerful characters like that in and very strong-willed in positions of, of strong influence? Yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was a challenge. Uh, uh, John Silver was a, uh, a, a very forceful uh, person. He reminds one of our present governor, about <laughs> present president. Uh, he, he ran for governor, and uh, they used to call them silver shockers. Uh, they asked him once, uh, as running for governor, now he's president of Boston University, running for governor, and way ahead in the polls, by the way. They asked him, uh, what are we going to do about the cost of health care? We've got all these very senior people, o older people, who are on this uh, various apparatus that are very expensive, it's becoming a big problem. He said, very simple, pull the plug. <laughs> and his polls went up. They asked him why he uh, continued to campaign, particularly have his uh, financial, you know, his uh, fundraisers in Newton and Brookline and Wayland and whatever. And he's never seen in Roxbury or Dorchester or the Black Area. He said, well, they're all drunks and derelicts and they don't vote. And his polls went up. <laughs> so uh, he would have been governor, and I think Jim will agree to this, except he took on uh, the, the week before the election uh, a local hero, a, a reporter in, in uh, Massachusetts that's beloved, and he jumped right down her throat, and uh, yeah, that's why he lost. So he was a real character. We were going along fine. Chair of the board was Marty Kaplan, a terrific guy, a, a Democrat, appointed by uh, Bill Weld. 
uh, did everything uh, Bill Weld wanted him to do. It was a very wonderful time. He was not a micromanager, very supportive. We were going along, everything's going fine, and uh, Bill Weld got reelected. And uh, as I say, somebody reported from his administration, he was feeling puckish that day. He puckish. decides to appoint his former opponent, John Silver, as chair of the board. So John was a very interesting guy, uh, very multifaceted, and had a lot of wonderful qualities, but he had a lot of tough qualities. And uh, he, it, was, uh, it was a daily struggle because uh, he, he, he was very disruptive. And uh, it took all of uh, those skills that I had as a teacher, patience, uh, et cetera, uh, to, to get through it. And I almost didn't survive, uh, but I did. And, and, you know, luckily for me, uh, I wound up with the votes. But um, he, he was very tough. And uh, I, I understood it. In some ways, you know, you, sometimes you need, uh, you need a little shakeup. But uh, we didn't need it at that time as we were doing well. And uh, he didn't know as much about K-12 to education as he thought he did. Well, I've been watching Jim and, and, and Meek and Dave uh, sign an all grin. Uh, <laughs> they, all, they, all have their, they all have their silver stories. Uh, and I'm looking at this, I've, I've picked up some of the You picked up some of the flavor. Uh, we're, but we're going to get to them now anyway. Uh, uh, thank you, David. Uh, uh, two of you, uh, Jim and me, could appear in the book, um, uh, Jim in a big way. Uh, David Steiner, I know you were present there too, though I didn't find you in the index. Um, but uh, you, uh, you, you described yourself in my presence as, 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 as bringing coffee into the meetings that included uh, uh, <laughs> people like uh, Driscoll and Silver. Um, so uh, at least three of you, though, were, were in Massachusetts while all this was going on. So I'd like from all three of you, actually, um, uh, what worked best, what didn't work very well, and what was it like to work with David Driscoll? <laughs> He's here, I know. <laughs> That's Go ahead, Jim. All right. Um, well, <clears throat> the, uh, I guess the thing that worked most was that, and it, it's, it, it's at least recounted in the book, and by the way, I'm holding the book up, it's it's Commitment and Common Sense, $30 on Amazon.com. <laughs> I think they're available. 20% discount. You can get them if, you, if you've got Amazon Prime, even less. You can get it delivered tomorrow. Go do it. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, the, the real um, reason for our success was, as it's described in the book, uh, David and I were competing for the job that he ultimately got. So I take full credit for the success of Massachusetts <laughs> America by failing to become commissioner. Wouldn't you agree, David? That was, that was a good move all around. Part of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, as I like to say, it was a win-win because uh, I ended up in a much better place and we ended up working uh, well together as a team. But, um, you know, I... I think maybe to, to, to sort of talk more about David and um, in particular why his skills were so well suited to the time and to the to the challenge. It, it sort of relates to the safe cracker, but uh, it also relates to this common sense um, label here because David, as I think you can tell just by listening to him, um, is grounded. He's he, he understands the practice and he applies common sense to it. So uh, as much as he may dismiss uh, research, he's read it all, um, but he's not sort of uh, approaching the work in a theoretical way or in a way that represents some sort of ideological or philosophical perspective. It's about what works and what works best for kids. And that came through really clearly. And that was in the, in the time when all of this was so controversial. Um, having that calming voice of someone who you could trust who um, wasn't, you could tell, wasn't trying to sort of pull something over on you, but actually was just trying to do what's the right thing, it just made a huge difference. I mean, a couple of things uh, as an example of that. One, um, when the test was, you know, out there and students weren't doing so well and people were complaining, oh, it's too hard or it's not fair or what have you, um, he insisted on, first of all, publishing all the questions. Uh, and second of all, urged people to take the test. Like, you don't, you don't think this is a fair test? Well, go on the website and take it. Um, and anyone who did that could see immediately that the questions weren't unfair. These were things that students should know and be able to do, and they were, it, it diffused the situation in a way that made the a lot of The test itself was totally transparent, yeah, at least after the fact. Absolutely. 
Uh, maybe, uh, Bill's going to do that with Nate questions one of these days, too. <laughs> that may cost you. I'll tell you, that's the expense, as you might already know. That's the expense um, a little bit. And that was, I mean, David didn't never care about what things cost. Of course, that, was, that wasn't <laughs> <laughs> this um, and, and another example was uh, when we were doing the math standards. And this was in the midst of the math wars, which I, I assume aren't over. They sort of go on forever. But they were uh, sort of reaching a bit of a fevered pitch. Uh, and we had this uh, fairly intense uh, debate over long division. <laughs> and um, and I and I remember um, that we were at um, I, I, it was at a board meeting, but we certainly had these conversations outside of the, the public eye as well. Um, and David just said very clearly, "Look, I'm a math teacher. They need to know how to do long division." Um, and that sort of again, sort of common sense, grounded approach to the work, I think, really made all the difference. Okay. So Mika, what did you Mika, what did you actually do there? <laughs> You've got a lot of gratitude for it. Thanks, Checker. Um, when Checker reached out to me, he said, Miguel, what did you actually do? And you were so young. Mm -hmm. um, and that is true. Um, I was one year out of college when I met David. Um, I was working for Howard Gardner at the, um, at the Graduate School of Education. And um, David had just concocted this 12 to 62 plan, which is articulated, I think, very clearly and accurately in the book. And he came, we met um, through a meeting that was happening at Harvard, and he said, come start the first office of teacher quality for the state. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And you were um, 22 or 3 years and old? And I was 23 years old. Um, I had um, fallen in love with education reform as an undergrad at Brown, working for Howard Gardner, uh, with Ted Sizer. I then went to go work for Howard Gardner, and then I met David. And I think the thing that made this opportunity so incredibly compelling, and what kept us there, and there were three of us, and um, they're all mentioned in the book, Celine Coggins, who did ultimately found Teach Plus, and really, I think, dreamed up Teach Plus while we were at the department, as we were looking looking at these issues of the career of an educator, um, and Dave Ferrero, and we were sort of the three musketeers. I mean, we went everywhere together. We showed up on our first day. There was a big office, one, for the three of us. There was no furniture in the room, but there were laptops. And so we opened our laptops, and we sat on the floor, and we started working. Um, and I think what was the secret sauce for us and what David allowed us to do is he put incredible trust in us. Um, he gave us the 12 to 62 plan, which really was a set of guardrails, and said, stick inside these guardrails, but go do. Go create programs so that we can recruit the best and the brightest. We can keep them. We can celebrate our veteran educators and help them, let them help the next generation be even better. Um, and I'll never forget, it was probably day 10. We still didn't have desks or chairs. We were still sitting on the floor. floor. Totally on the floor, happy to be there. Um, and David calls an off, uh, the office of the commissioner into a meeting, which is about 60 or 80 people at that point. And it's myself, again, I'm 23 or 4 at this point, 23. Celine Coggins is 24. Um, Dave Ferrer is 25. And he introduces us to the 60 folks who have been working for him for a long time and have been in Malden for even longer. And he says, this is Mika, this is Celine, this is David, and um, just do what they tell you. They're all twice your age. Easily. <laughs> Many more than that. Um, and they mostly were former educators who had come to the state to do policy work. And I had not taught. Celine had taught for two years. Um, and then he sort of left. <laughs> and we were left to so go fishing ourselves. And what it really did for me, at least, um, in that moment was teach me that my job now was to go build relationships across the department that we were this sort of entrepreneurial skunk works inside what felt like a very bureaucratic office to me at that stage of my life, right? But we had some room to go be creative, and that's what David allowed us to do. And he trusted us, and we made all sorts of mistakes, I'm sure of it. Um, I remember coming in one day, and there was a Globe article printed out on my chair with a big red circle around a quote that I had given to a reporter, and it just said, come see me. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm definitely <laughs> going to be fired. But you know, that's how we learned. And that was really David saying, I trust you. Here's the guardrails. Go do. But we talked every day. Um, and David really believed that together we were going to make things happen for educators in Massachusetts, and I believe we did. So it was an incredible opportunity um, for someone at my stage in life, and um, it has taught me a lot that I continue to use today. We'll come back to the continue to use, because lessons for other places, I think, is relevant here. Catherine, does she have a, ta a chair and a desk now? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, good. She's she does really good work sitting on the 
I do. She does. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer the floor, actually. So, David Steiner, how how was how was the did you have decaf? Uh, how was the coffee? What did you do? So, uh, John Silber hired me after a twelve-minute interview in which he said, "Have you written anything worth my reading?" Um, and I I thought a little bit. I took the plane back to Vanderbilt where I was working, and I sent him a very obscure essay on a Jewish philosopher called Levinas, and nothing happened. One month went by, two months went by. Uh, about five and a half months later, I came home to my answering machine and it was flickering and I pushed the button and it said, this is silver. It's not entirely unreadable. Call my secretary. <laughs> um, that, that, that was how I was hired. Um, I was the junior person of, of Silber's group. Uh, there were two very able people working with me, Paul and Susan. Um, and uh, David Driscoll was the person who uh, was always expected to give in or exemplify the status quo, uh, the apologists for the low standard, the representative of everything that was evil. Um, because Silber was smart, no matter what his failings, um, I think he gradually realized that this just wasn't right, um, that he was dealing with somebody who had genuine talent. It was a slow evolution that was always begrudging. But I, I have to say that as someone who was there and sat through a number of the board meetings and um, listened while I was carrying the coffee, um, that uh, Silver's not here to defend himself um, because he's in another world, either below or above us, um, or perhaps being Silver in both. Um, but. Uh, Th the fact of the matter is that there were times when his courage was remarkable. And uh, there's, a, there's some passages in the book that talk about the teacher test. Uh, no question uh, for anyone who is sane, uh, there were aspects of that test that were bizarre, um, such as the dictation, uh, which was dictation mentioned. Part. The dictation part, which was mentioned here. However, um, those who've studied the Massachusetts miracle, and including one person about whom's silence, I am disturbed in the book, and we'll come back to that, uh, have argued that the, the teacher test and what was done around it probably did as much as anything uh, to create that miracle. And while the particular aspect of the test may have been a little nutty, uh, or bits of it, standing up for the fact that while in every other state, at the praxis pass levels were 98%, that 55% um, pass rate in Massachusetts sent a signal that reverberated through the years. Um, and I, I wish that Silber had been given a little bit of credit. Um, if I, and I, I'm at a huge disadvantage here because, of course, uh, David knows far, 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 far more factual uh, background than I do. But from where I sat, um, that was a, it was a courageous, if in part nutty, uh, test a courageous act to hold the line on something that created enormous blowback uh, for Silva uh, as much as for anyone else. Um, so back to you, Dave Driscoll, for just a second on this one. Uh, is that uh, uh, Dave Steyer's take on the teacher test? And uh, I, I read about it in the, uh, in the book, obviously. It's also part of why you did become commissioner. Um, the uh, sort of early, some early bungling with respect to the teacher test before you became commissioner. Um, does this uh, sound about right? Well, no, not really. But uh, <laughs> let, let me say it this way: I think David is right. He's either below us or above us, or if it's silver, maybe both. Yes. He's a very complex person, <coughs> and when he was good, he was very good. Yeah. And so, yes, he yes he was right about re uh, uh, sticking to high standards. That was true across the board. He wanted the graduation requirement to be at proficient. Mm -hmm. uh, he wanted what, what was called the basic level, he wanted to call that failing <coughs> uh, to get them out, you know. Uh, it, 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 they were throwing all kinds of names, deficient, deficient. And, and he would throw all kinds of names around. At one point he said, uh, I said, well, what about needs improvement, Mr. Chairman? I, you know, he said to me, what about needs improvement? And I said, well, in a way, uh, Mr. Chairman, everybody needs improvement, even the kids ad advanced. I said, really, everybody needs improvement. Of course, you, except you, of course. 
<laughs> and he laughed. Uh, he laughed. So <laughs> I, I had that, uh, as most people do, David, I, I had this uh, hot and cold relationship with him. And I actually think at one point he would have supported me. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. But, but he can't help himself. So I, I certainly uh, can give him credit for, for uh, holding to high standards. And there's a lot of good things to be said about John Silver. And we certainly at times have at times had a very uh, had a lot of fun actually he's had a great sense of humor etc but he can't help himself so when you talk about high standard he didn't invent that that came with the that came with the law I will agree that our people dragged dragged it out in, in instituting the test but we would have gone we went to bid we weren't going with praxis we would have gone to a high standard the problem with John Silver is he wanted down deep he wanted to embarrass the uh, the public school the the public uh, schools of education and higher education he had that side to him so so that's why I think you have to moderate it yes he was for high standards and I give him great credit <coughs> but he, but he also put that in one one uh, odd thing so so most of the public and he was right about the schools of education and I agreed with him and this was going to be a way that we could hold them accountable. Uh, but but he just he, he just went too far in my judgment. But when the results came out, uh, it, uh, most of the publics didn't do very well at all. Boston University did very well. Uh, Boston College did even better. Mm. Uh, and so he said to me, "Well, you know, Boston University." And Harvard went to Boston College yeah. in case you didn't. And, and, I, I, and, I, and, so, uh, and Harvard uh, 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 did even better. But so we. Uh, Boston College got uh, seven points higher than Boston University on the test, and both very high. Amazing. Well, he had just eliminated football. I said, hey, we beat you by a touchdown. <laughs> <laughs> Which he did laugh, David. So, uh, so that's why, I mean, it's, uh, uh, I'd be glad to debate uh, okay. John Silver uh, later. <laughs> um, Bill, you're sort of the auditor here. Um, <laughs> I've been called lots of things, but that's the one thing I haven't I don't, called yet. Well, I don't just mean audit in the sense of patiently listening. I actually mean in the sense of uh, checking the data. Yeah. Is the Massachusetts miracle for real? Now, now I know, uh, to the huge discredit of NAEP, you don't have 2017 data out yet. Uh, and that up, right? And it is Christmas, uh, and uh, we should have those data. But based on what you've got, uh, and other data available to you. Uh, is this for real? Did, did, uh, who, who benefited? Who didn't benefit? Is it sustained? What do you, what, how do you see the, the actual outcomes? Yes. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me here. Um, I really, I, before we talk about that, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. And uh, I, I'm sure many of you have read it because you're probably part of it. But I found it um, r really affirming, uh, looking back on my career. Um, it, it's about policy and the implementation of policy, and it's also about personalities and, and the intersection of the two. And I found that, again, really helpful uh, for some of you that are earlier in your career. If, if you read it in that context and understand it, you're, it's not just about implementing things. It's also about working with other people in, in sometimes um, easy uh, relationships and other times slightly more difficult relationships, <laughs> as, as you have heard a little bit about already. The other thing about the book, and I shared this with David, I, I really enjoyed the part on teaching. David started as a classroom teacher and talked about those, those years, and, and it took me back to my years as a classroom teacher and how much back in my 20s, how much I enjoyed that. So I didn't have, I didn't have to face a whole bunch of adults. I faced a whole bunch of junior high kids teaching science, but it was really a, a, a great opportunity to remind me of those years and how much I liked it, and, uh, and so I wanted to thank David for that. So in answer to your question, first mm -hmm. of all, um, sometimes I just start talking about NAEP and assuming that everybody knows everything there is to know about NAEP, and I've, so just a couple things. Um, it's a National Assessment of Educational Progress. Uh, the first version of NAEP has been around since uh, the uh, early 70s, and then it was modified very significantly, and Checker was um, uh, very much involved in the, in the uh, re, re uh, formatting really, of NAEP in the late 80s, early 90s, um, when it was finally given for the first time uh, to states, um, all the states, and also now to 27 large urban districts who voluntarily participate. It is a representative sample of students, so we don't test every student. Um, we test only uh, students in 4th, 8th, and 12th grades. 
Uh, the, the main part of the assessment is uh, in reading and mathematics. Uh, that's given every two years. We, uh, we did give the, or the assessment this last winter. We are right now transitioning from pencil and paper to a digital format. Um, and so that's the reason the results are going to be out um, in early uh, 2018. One of the things that differentiates NAEP um, over the state assessments is our devotion to trend. So um, it's, it's all about knowing whether nationally and now at the state level and some of the assessments, <coughs> are we making progress, are we not? And what we're finding is that states increasingly, based upon the example set by Massachusetts, are recognizing that their state assessments, they're forced to make changes and do different kinds of things with their state assessments. So they can't monitor trend over the long term, but they can rely upon on NAEP for that data. So uh, now to your question, uh -huh. Tucker. Uh, w without question, uh, Massachusetts, uh, by NAEP data, demonstrated very significant gains, and they remain at the top right now. Um, I want to thank Laura Legerfo in our office. Laura, raise your hand a little bit, please. Okay, we're in the corner over there. Uh, Laura um, is our analyst and uh, on reporting, and, and uh, Laura really helped us uh, put together some data here. So, um, so how are you doing? Well, in the latest results, 2015, um, in every category where we have state results, and that's math, reading, and science for grades four and eight, Massachusetts is. Uh, not only at the top, but they are at the top by either eight to between eight or eighteen points um, across the board. So yes, they're they are in the lead. There's no question about that. Um, in 2015, in reading, um, over 50 percent of the students in Massachusetts scored at proficient or above. Again, which differentiates and puts Massachusetts in a very different category. Um, when you look in the, er, the mid-90s, uh, so the, the state NAEP goes back to the early 90s. When you look in the mid-90s, Massachusetts was about where you would expect Massachusetts to be. It was in the year 2000 and then in a couple se subsequent, subsequent um, assessments that Massachusetts leaped ahead. And, and since that time, since the 2000-2003, uh, Massachusetts has maintained its status um, at the top. So when you say about where you would expect it to be, you mean demographically and every other way I they were? I think when you, when you step back and so on. They yes. were not out of the pack at that point. No, they were definitely not. Um, okay. we, we only have, uh, so that's fourth and eighth grade. We only have 12th grade data, um, and Checker and I have talked a little bit about this. Many times, and we're going to continue yes, to yeah. until you fix it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Checker has an interesting, we, we meet for lunch. It's in his office. We bring our own, it's BYOL. <laughs> and uh, and we, invariably we get back to uh, 12th grade assessment. Um, but so we have uh, results for just in, in 2009, 2013, and these are states that voluntarily participated. Uh, but even there, again, Massachusetts is well above. Now. Uh, what we saw is a huge gains uh, up until about 2007, I think, assessment, Laura, I think that's right. And then it has kind of been steady since then, but uh, still above, well above uh, many of the other states. Um, the, the last thing is the question of what about the, uh, the gap, the achievement gap? And David already spoke to this. Um, by NAEP data, um, the gap has not closed. It stayed stubbornly about the same as where it's been um, uh, since the early 2000s. However, um, David uses the term uh, lifting all boats, and th that is the case. So the scores not only went up for Caucasian students, they, they have increased for African American students, they have increased for uh, proportionally for uh, Hispanic students, or there's another way to uh, cut, uh, slice and dice this, uh, they have uh, increased for uh, uh, on SES. So uh, it answered, it, and, and then the, other, the last thing is um, uh, states, a couple states can participate, you can participate in PISA now. That's an assessment, representative sa uh, uh, sample assessment given to 15 year olds. And as a state, you can participate, and Massachusetts had elected to do that. And um, there again, uh, they've showed uh, terrific results in, on PISA, uh, top, top in the world of all the different systems in reading, 
um, second in science. I'm, I'm looking at Laura here. She's my crutch. <laughs> and, uh, and math, there are, there are a couple of other countries that have uh, surpassed Massachusetts. But um, so long way of saying yes. Uh, w as an auditor, we would say that uh, the data in NAEP supports the results. Now, the one last thing, mm -hmm. and, and this was we, we at, at NAEP uh, were a little miffed, quite <laughs> honestly, um, in reading uh, David's book. So um, <laughs> in the introduction, uh, on the very first page, NAEP does appear, but not until the 17th word. <laughs> there are 16 <laughs> words in front of NAEP. So David, for the second edition, we have rewritten the first sentence so that NAEP starts the entire book. <laughs> Nate, Nate proves that. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, but you did say, let me just come back for one second, that the major bumps that you saw took place from the end of the 90s to around 2007. Is that, am I hearing you correctly? Yes, that's the major bumps. And that it's been more or less steady state since then? Yes. Okay, so we'll, we should get to... Uh, with David and, and, and Jim um, uh, in, in a minute, why that might be the case. Well, you need to remember I left in 2007. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll get to Jim then, uh, since he's in office. But first, back to, back to David Steiner, because you uh, not only were in Massachusetts for um, a part of this, you then uh, led the state system in New York, and now I know you're working with a bunch of states. Uh, so you've got on, on their reform strategies and ESSA and so forth, uh, so from this kind of multi-state perspective that you, that you bring to bear, um, what did Massachusetts do right and anything it did wrong, and what should reform-minded other states like Maryland um, learn from it and do differently today? Well, first of all, it, it got massively more right than it got wrong, uh, as is clear from the data. Uh, I have a tiny, because we, we are in a research-driven institution, I would ask for a little bit more detail. My understanding is that African-American performance in Massachusetts is actually not very different from where it is in the rest of the United States. I'm seeing a nodding head okay. there. So, so there is a real problem okay. there, which we shouldn't whitewash, because we want to congratulate on the extraordinary, accurately positive results that David got. Um, second point, Massachusetts began the work in taking seriously one of the two things that matter most, what we teach, not only everything else. Um, the, the curriculum frameworks were really the first time since the 19th century that this country had taken seriously this question of responsibility on the part of the state for what it was that children would learn. Um, we are now in what I would call the second wave of that work, led probably by John White in Louisiana, uh, where we're looking at the actual texts and the content. But there's no question that Massachusetts raised that banner um, and started that work for the whole country. Uh, and as I say, um, many states are now beginning to take instructional materials seriously, uh, but Massachusetts did so before anybody else. That's the first thing. And then in the second half of the equation, not only what we teach, but how effectively we teach it, uh, again, Massachusetts, with that tough teacher test, and with the work it did, really, I think, overlooked, and it's important that it's in this book, of how to get at encouraging able young people to go into teaching. And that's obviously your work. Um, we, we haven't paid enough attention to that because it's, it's not enough to just have a tough test, important as that is. You then have to actually encourage people at the higher end of the achievement scale to think about teaching as a career. And most states have done very little or nothing, frankly to move that. Uh, and it's one of the, my great disappointments that the extraordinary program that was put in in Massachusetts was sunsetted or the funding was removed. I'd love to hear more about that. Uh, 1262, I think yeah. it was called. Um, we need far more 1262s across the United States. Um, the last thing I'll say is that what Massachusetts did above all else was show that real improvement was possible mm. um, if you had courage. Uh, when I was commissioner in New York, um, one of the first things we had to face was the fact that we were lying, frankly, about our state test results. 
which were going up, 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 and beyond, out of sight. Uh, and I remember when we recalibrated them, just the invective that poured down uh, on our heads from superintendents who very frankly should have been ashamed of themselves um, uh, in what they were screaming about because they knew the truth. But we had Massachusetts to look back on and say, look, they stuck it. They, were, they didn't cave in. They followed the course and look what happened. Mm -hmm. It gave courage to a lot of people who came afterwards. And now if you look across the country, Louisiana, New Mexico, Tennessee, other states um, that are standing up and doing the right thing, but it was Massachusetts that came first. Thank you. Uh, Jim, Pizer, back to you if you would. So it's, it's now 10 years since 2007. Um, and a lot of uh, water has gone over the dams in Massachusetts. Uh, uh, and some great people working there, including uh, the, the much missed Mitchell Chester, um, as a recent leader of the state system. Um, what's, um, wh what do you make of the sort of leveling off phenomenon and uh, as you, from your current position, and what do you think lies ahead? So I guess first I'd um, reflect back on what David said about the changing demographics of our student population. So to some extent, standing in place may actually be improvement. Um, I, I do think some of the NAEP results, uh, you know, certainly give you pause uh, in terms of our lack of progress over the last 10 years in subgroups as well as overall. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the, the data um, does suggest that the progress we were seeing at the beginning, we certainly aren't seeing now. <clears throat> and um, I think part of that is because um, we were successful at capturing the low-hanging fruit. And by low-hanging, I don't mean easy, right? Th those were really hard things to do. But uh, getting curriculum aligned within schools around standards, uh, getting uh, a, a deeper focus or a much more intense focus on struggling students. I think this is very underappreciated that especially at the high school but at all grade levels, it used to be kind of easy to write off the students who weren't doing that well. Now there was a light that was being shined upon them uh, in part because of the accountability system, in part because of the reports that were just going home to parents and it caused a very intense focus on those students, so again especially at the high school level and I think that has had significant impact as well. And then maybe the the third thing is that um, as a result of uh, the accountability system, as a result of the, the data that was available, the increasing amount of data that was available, I think there was a greater sense of both collective responsibility within schools for student achievement as well as a, as a heightened sense that data uh, and assessment, not, the sum, not so much the summit of assessments, but other assessments that could be done throughout the course of the year and school day uh, could actually drive instruction in a way that made a difference. So you know, more, more use of data driving instruction, better alignment of curriculum, better more focus on the low performing students. I think those three things, and th I'm sure there are others, but those three things, all of which really were driven by the reform that, that happened starting in 93, I think got us to where we needed to go. And th that was tremendously important. Now it's kind of harder to take the next step. I mean, it relates to the quality of teaching in the classroom. I mean, ultimately, that is tremendously important. It relates to school leadership, uh, which is also an area that has been underinvested in, and we have a lot more, uh, a, lo a long way to go in terms of quality. So I think those things are important. Uh, I'll just say a few other things that we're, that we're doing to try to keep the needle moving in the right direction. One is just reinforcing the foundations of, um, of the reform that got us to this point. So the standards, the assessments, the accountability system, those things, uh, those things actually still matter. They're still controversial. They need upgrading and improvement. Uh, and, and we've been paying a lot of attention to that. Um, we're trying to focus, uh, Dave mentioned early education. Uh, most of the focus we did create uh, after 1993, a Department of Early Education and Care, and sort of spun it out of uh, the Department of Education. And that was an important statement. Again, to your point, it may have been more symbolic than real in many ways, but now what we're trying to, uh, but the focus had been really more on access and not on quality. But in terms of actually moving the needle in terms of student achievement when student, when children get into elementary school and beyond, it's quality that matters. And so trying to invest heavily and in, 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 in a targeted way on improving the quality of early education. 
trying to take some of the lessons perhaps from the charter uh, success in Massachusetts, but also just what we're learning in general about what works in schools to empower schools and educators to actually take more control over their work, take more ownership and responsibility while continuing to hold them accountable, but devolving more of the responsibility away from central offices and down to school levels. Um, we're working significantly to increase the number of pathways through high school in particular, especially around STEM and career uh, um, pathways. Um, and this is, you know, in part, again, getting back to what Dave was talking about earlier, creating more relevance to the curriculum, creating more student engagement, uh, and ensuring that students understand that what they're doing in the classroom actually not only has application outside the classroom, but has meaning in their lives uh, uh, in school and beyond. And then finally, um, in, the, in the area of uh, sort of college readiness, college affordability and, and success, I think, are, are key uh, challenges for us and one of the things that we're trying to push very strongly now is early college programs to get young children, uh, get uh, young high school students, especially those in underserved communities or who maybe are first generation students or low income students who don't have college on the horizon. From the moment they enter high school they are on a track that gets them ready for success in college and gets them acclimated to that being their destination. So. I don't know if any of these are actually the, the way in which we move from you know, stagnation to another leap in NAEP scores, but when all is said and done, I think our biggest challenge is the, the growing sense of complacency among the public in general that we've, we've solved this problem mm. and that you know, what we just need to do is you know, keep doing what we're doing, maybe put a little more money in the system and it'll all be, it'll all be good because after all we're number one. Um, and that's, in some ways, our biggest challenge is, is acknowledging the success that we've had while at the same time recreating that sense of urgency about the need for improvement. So the, 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 the downside of a miracle is that everyone can now feel like they're miracle workers and, and, and sort of rest on their halos. Um, the, uh, so do you still have the sense in Massachusetts that people are pulling in the same direction? Is it still bipartisan? Is it still a kind of a... A, a sense that uh, there's a unified interest in making it better, or is that sort of fragmented like everything else in American politics? So is this still being recorded? <laughs> <laughs> being blasted out to the world. Uh, I would say we've run across a few bumps in the road in terms of our uh, consensus around education reform. And, I, and again, I, I think it really was a consensus and one that was sustained over many years. I don't think there has been a retreat, sort of a wholesale retreat from the, the underlying foundations of education reform, but they are now much more in question and they are much more the subject of debate. And the legislature, especially probably on the Senate side, uh, has elevated these questions to a point where uh, I think some of the gains that we've made in terms of policy are at risk. Uh, certainly on the charter school front, which has been one of the great parts of the success story in Massachusetts, uh, we had a ballot question, as many of you know, last year, which went down to inglorious defeat. Um, and that, uh, that campaign, uh, unfortunately, besides it, it sort of going in the wrong direction, from my opinion, uh, created much deeper fissures in the political landscape than I thought were there. Um, and uh, that's a, d a very deep concern. And they were, they were very much sort of on a, on a partisan basis as well, which is equally troubling, because as you mentioned earlier, Checo, the, the bipartisanness of this reform has been one of the keys to success. And now that's being brought into a little bit of question. I'm still hopeful that we're keeping, you know, we're, we're keeping everybody on the uh, on the bus, um, but it's getting a little bit harder than it used to be. Okay, uh, Mika. So say a little bit more about 1262, and in particular, uh, how do your Massachusetts lessons apply to what you're doing in D.C. and and beyond? Sure. So. Um, as it's written, the idea was to build the career ladder from age 12 to 62. Um, and I don't, I wish I did, but I don't remember the very early conversations where we sort of said who's going to take the 12-year-olds and who's going to take the 62-year-olds. Um, but we sort of divided up the world that way. Um, and a couple of things specifically that we did that I think are, um, have been invaluable for me, but I think for lessons um, across the country. So 
we ultimately decided to hire the new teacher project, which at that time was really in its infancy. And in fact, we hired Michelle Ree herself, and I managed oh. Michelle Ree as a 23-year-old, which um, we tried to manage Michelle. Tried to manage Michelle, and actually, you left out the amazing Ann Duffy in this book, who actually came and sat in our office as part of our team, really building out what we called Massachusetts Institute for New Teachers. We called it Mint, um, and the idea was to go out to the best colleges and universities across the country and find the best and the brightest to and recruit them to come teach in our classrooms in Massachusetts. And so Ann Duffy and I got on the road and we traveled all over the country and um, a la TFA, we put on these recruiting sessions for college juniors and seniors at the time. Um, because we had this $100 million endowment for teacher quality, we created the funding we were talking about earlier that's not there anymore. That is the money that right. is not there anymore, yeah. but it was there at the time, um, and we were working off the interest of that endowment yeah. for these endowment. programs. A real um, endowment. A real until endowment. It did, until it wasn't one anymore. Until it wasn't one anymore. Right. That's right. So it was uh, revealed as really an appropriation after all was said and done. Uh -huh. an they can be taken away. An annual appropriation that can stop. Right. Yes. I think it went to good things. But um, anyway, we so we had about $3 million a year um, in service of these programs. And so we, call, we created something called the, uh, we created a signing bonus for these young educators and actually mid-career professionals as well who wanted to come teach in classrooms in Massachusetts. And they became tagged as the bonus babies. And it was front page of the Boston Globe, you know, David Driscoll, bonus babies. Um, and we were in the state house dealing with the press. Um, but we set out on this course to recruit these young folks and mid-career changers. We ran summer school programs where they taught in summer school classrooms in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, again, very much built on the DNA of Teach for America. And then we put them in classrooms all over um, the state. And they had to get the job themselves. But we worked very hard to make sure those connections were made with districts all over the state to ensure that they were going into classrooms and schools where they were needed. Um, it was a lot of fun for me then when I joined Catherine Bradley at City Bridge 10 years ago, and Michelle Rhee was, of course, chancellor for DC schools, and one of the first things Catherine and I did together was to go see Michelle, and um, here we were again together in a very different relationship. So um, that was a nice full circle moment for me. The other thing that came up um, during that time was there were about five teachers across the state who had been nationally board certified, and they were all over the state, and they weren't in touch with one another, they didn't even know each other, and David realized that they were a real asset to the work, and one of the things he wanted to do was to encourage more educators to become nationally board certified. So he gave me their phone numbers, and he said, call them and figure out what we're going to do. Um, and these five folks became some of my best friends in the two years that I was at the department. Um, and one of the things I realized in that moment was when you have 360 districts, you can't treat them all the same. Um, and luckily, these five educators were really spread out across the state. And so each of them said, well, I'd be willing to basically hold a tutoring session, a training session for teachers who are preparing to go through national board certification. And so we actually set up regional centers for educators who are working on their portfolio. And these five folks became real leaders in the state. Um, and I remember getting a call one day from a teacher on Nantucket. And she said, you can't hold a PD session you know, at 4.30 and wherever um, and expect us to get there. <laughs> you know, we have to take a boat and then a, and then a bus. And um, you know, I, well, eyes wide open as a you know, young person in the department trying to figure out how to meet the needs of educators across um, a very complex state. But those were the kinds of things that we were given the opportunity to create and to build. Um, Celine Coggin spent a lot of time thinking about veteran educators and how did we make sure that they were being deployed to educate and train our next generation of teachers in the classroom. We spent most of our time out in schools and that was a real privilege um, and that was the opportunity David afforded us to get out into classrooms across the state and listen to teachers and make sure we were designing programs that were in service of the things that they really needed and wanted and not just deciding in Malden what was going to be best for every teacher in the state. Part of what's uh, striking, um, especially in your comments, is the degree to which in this city where we think that if it's in law or regulation, it, it's happening, there's, there's a huge amount of kind of improvisation uh, in what you're describing, isn't there, that's not codified in, uh, in some law or, po or policy or reg. It's just happening because people are making it happen. Let me give an example. Um, 
my wife and I had the privilege for several years of leading content institutes for high school teachers in Massachusetts. Um, it was just an idea we had that maybe it would be a good idea to read books uh, with teachers. Read books um, with teachers. And uh, I remember teaching King Lear. Um, my wife did The Bluest Eye. And for five, six days, 8.30 in the morning till 5, we just did line-by-line line analysis. And uh, when we suggested the idea, we thought, oh, gosh, I mean, the chances of us being approved to do this, getting a little funding to do this. And within 24 hours, we, we were told, put a proposal together. We put the proposal together, and we did it for multiple years. And teachers had tears in their eyes at the end. They, I now remember why I went into teaching high school literature. Right, um, That ability to just respond to good ideas as opposed to there being some statute as you yeah. point out was truly remarkable and I wish we could do it more often. And Mika what you're describing was being done at least most of it on three million dollars a year? I think that was about what we were using. Uh, if I can add one more great story the Minister of Education of Spain reached out to David when um, when we were in the office and said, what do you think about bringing teachers from Spain to come teach in your um, ESL and Spanish classrooms in Massachusetts? And there was a need for Spanish teachers. And so we said, great, let's give it a go. And so David sent me and um, the superintendent from Revere uh, two years in a row to Madrid, um, and we interviewed teachers. I spoke no Spanish. Um, we interviewed teachers to hire to come back to Massachusetts and teach in our classrooms. And I mean, it was this incredible opportunity, and this community of educators was built. They became their own best supports, and they were they knew they knew David. We would have we gather them for dinner with the superintendents and all of us in the office. So it really was an opportunity to take advantage of what we were hearing and seeing as need and be creative within the confines of, I, I hope, a responsible set of um, decisions and guidelines. Um, thank you. As you all can see, we're capable up here of continuing this, but after an hour and a half, I think it's your turn. Uh, and um, I think we should uh, see what questions people here have. Uh, Catherine, thank you for coming and uh, for being Mika's current uh, leader and mentor. Okay, bye. Uh, who here has something they'd like to say or ask? So we've got mics. You're going to have to identify yourself for the purposes of the worldwide audience um, and, uh, and, and make a question, not a long speech. I can do that. Barbara Davidson with Standards Work and uh, also run the Knowledge Matters campaign. So I appreciate David Steiner's um, mentioning the importance of the curriculum work and the fact that the focus was on what is being taught. I'm interested, um, David Driscoll, in hearing a little bit more about that. About I mean, I know that the Massachusetts standards had a reading list, and that was pretty exceptional at the time. I don't think any other state standards did that. But I'm interested uh, particularly in some of the specifics that, that may have been uh, state policy or that directed at the s uh, from the state about that, that, that caused there to be a greater focus on what kids were learning. Well, I think that uh, <clears throat> the strength there was uh, utilizing the, the power of, of the people in the Commonwealth. And David mentioned uh, he and his wife. Uh, <laughs> when we developed the curriculum frameworks, uh, we put together uh, people from the state, uh, teachers, uh, department heads, uh, other uh, people from higher education, et cetera. And, uh, and, and really, other than saying we want to know, you know, we want standards that eventually need to be assessed, uh, you know, tell us what kids should know and be able to do at, uh, at the various levels. So they were really free uh, to develop the frameworks. And uh, uh, it, it was, uh, w w so we first put the frameworks out, w we got A's. We got A's from Fordham and the AFT. You can't do much better than that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Just from Fordham should have been enough. <laughs> <laughs> And Sorry, uh, <laughs> so interestingly enough, I, I look back now and, and uh, I look back then, and, and I look back after we did a few iterations and, and realized those were, even though they received A's, uh, and David's right, it was a key element in our reform to actually uh, specify what kids should know and be able to do. Uh, they were pretty broad, and it was over time 
that, uh, and it really was as a result of giving the first assessment, even though it was a trial, uh, teachers would say, we don't see the connection between, even though the test was developed based on the frameworks. So we did what I, I describe in the book as a bridge document. Uh, the assessment people back, went back the other way. We did it backwards, but we did it right. And so uh, then people knew, uh, because every, every test question had to have a standard associated with it. So it was a, a little bit of a shakedown cruise over four or five years. You're right about we had, we had a lot of input. And that's where John Silver, uh, actually, and Sam Dostoevsky really raised the level, particularly in the English language arts, with the, the uh, suggested reading lists and, and that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, but it was a, it was a, a group effort. And they were given carte blanche, so to speak, uh, even though there was a lot of review. And then it had to go out to the public, of course, including the school districts to, to vet and so forth. It, it turned out to be uh, one of our crowning moments, to be sure. Can I just quickly jump in? Yeah, please, Jim. Because I, this, the standards, I think, um, were of high quality themselves. And again, I, they you know, went through several iterations and got stronger. I do think Sandy played a really important role in, in development of those. But the assessment, and Jeff Nellis is here, um, you can't really separate assessment from standards because if the assessment is weak or misaligned, it negates really the strength of the standards. And by the other side of the, the other side of the coin, to the extent the assessment is aligned and rigorous, it makes the standards that much stronger. And I think we got both parts of those uh, that equation right, and that just made yeah. all the difference. Uh, can I just tell yeah. the, the one quick story, which is very, very uh, illustrious. Uh, fourth grade. I looked at the fourth grade, grade results, which, by the way, is why I have very little sympathy for principals and the superintendents and others that don't dive into the data, if a commissioner can do it. But I looked at the fourth grade results, and um, there was a division problem, and the kids, with this back to what Jim was talking about, and two-thirds of the kids couldn't get a simple division problem uh, right. And so I went out among the highways and byways of my old math friends, and I said, what's going on? And they said, well, you know, we don't do algorithms anymore. And ironically, Jim was just chair of the board, and he said to me one day something about algorithms. So it, 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 it turned out to be something. And, and what algorithms are is the old, uh, you know, uh, carrying, you know. And so borrowing. Borrowing. So, <laughs> so we realized that, uh, so, so the next iteration of the math standards, we said, Algorithms uh, need to be one of the ways that you teach uh, uh, multiplication and division. And uh, we didn't mandate it, and we didn't um, test it. Uh, but two years later, two-thirds of our fourth graders could do a division problem. So there was a correction that was made really based on common sense. Um, yeah, well, um, I, I just want to comment. Uh, Jim mentioned a minute ago that you can't separate standards from assessments and the alignment between them, which I totally agree with. But it just occurs to me that uh, uh, 20 years ago, that would have been a meaningless statement in the United States of America, because we didn't actually have either one. The, the assessment was the Iowa test of basic skills, and the states didn't have standards, and uh, you'd be reported on a, on, a, on a norm as to how many of your kids were above and below average, and that was called grade level. Uh, and in Massachusetts, we had something called the MEEP, the MEEP, M-E-A-P, I think, yeah. um, which was a test that had no consequences um, and was based on no standards. So it was, we, you know, <laughs> but we did it. I believe, I believe, Jeff, everybody got 99%, didn't they, on the MEEP? 99% <laughs> passing on the MEEP, something like that? It's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got several people with their hands up. Uh, let's, let's go here and then there. Um, I know about half the people in the room's names, but you've got to introduce yourself anyway. Yes, Susan Sclafani. Uh, my question really gets back to what David was talking about with innovation. I, I mean, I know in Houston, when Mike Feinberg went to sat, uh, sat on uh, Rod's car, we figured out how to do charter schools before there was ever a charter school law. What are you doing, Jim, to <laughs> ensure that... He's ensure that innovation continues to enable us to break out of the standard ways of doing things so that you get that next burst of improvement across the state. So I, I guess uh, if I'm going to be honest in answering your question, is that, is that a, is that a it's desirable. <laughs> it's not imperative. <laughs> but we're in DC. So <laughs> oh, 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 point. Hey, sorry. Give us some space. Context is. Um, I think this, I think this is a huge hole in our. Um, 
sort of collective uh, approach to education, continuing education reform, or uh, that's, I guess, now becoming kind of a bad word, but continuing our educational improvement. Um, I mean, charter schools obviously were an element of innovation, um, but uh, A, we've, we sort of reached a bit of a, a ceiling in, in charter growth in Massachusetts, and B, uh, a lot of the charter growth wasn't innovation per se, it was kind of replication su of success. Um, we have, you know, in Massachusetts we have, so obviously we're, you know, leading uh, edge state when it comes to technology, we're leading edge state when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship and so many other domains. Uh, but when I compare us to California, for example, uh, I think we're just way behind the curve. Um, and uh, I, I honestly, I'm looking for I'm looking for good ideas about how we can stimulate that. It's it's obviously somewhat difficult to do from a bureaucratic or state policy point of view. Um, sometimes we may get in the way, and that's the thing that we really need to look look for. But how we actually stimulate real innovation in the classroom, I think it's it's a real challenge for us. Okay. Oh, actually, sorry, we're going to him first, and then to you. Are you behind the post? <laughs> sorry. Uh, Mike Eustan. Uh, Dave, I'd like you to amplify, if you would, uh, those of us with gray hair who are AARPers, they more than eligible for AARP, uh, have lived through a number of cycles of shifts in the federal system. And I was particularly intrigued with your point about the need for a role for the federal government. And maybe addition number two, I don't want to give you another assignment, <laughs> but it seems to me because of your unique leadership at the state level and the fact that explicitly, whether it's civil rights or equity or collecting research, how do we recalibrate the federal-state relationship in light of the current chaos <laughs> and polarization, which is dysfunctional across the board. <laughs> which, which is at the base of the problem, Mike, uh, uh, frankly. Uh, one of my predecessor predecessors was Greg Anrig, who many people in this room might remember, who was a wonderful, wonderful man. And he used to say, uh, the federal government gives me 7% of my money, so I'll give them 7% of my attention. Uh, you know, I, I really think it's this semblance of water, Mike, that we're, we're, that we're losing and, that, and the polarization is the case. I mean, I actually think uh, it probably was a good thing to go back uh, to states with the SSA, et cetera, but it was almost like uh, uh, too far. Was, you know, you had legislators saying, wow, uh, I don't want the feds involved in anything. Uh, just let the states decide. I mean, what, what is that about? I mean, we really did have this case back when No Child Left Behind came in when the states weren't getting the job done. So I think it's a terrible analogy, but Chuck, I mentioned rowing in the same direction. I think that's what needs to happen. And the federal government has a, a very good role to play. And uh, I think that uh, that role uh, should be defined and should be logical uh, <laughs> and, and, and should be consistent. And yet, uh, we <laughs> jump from pillar to post. That's, that's the problem. So uh, I don't have an answer for you, uh, certainly, uh, except as to what should be. And, and I think the role, the, the, there should be a good, healthy role for the, I mean, the Federal uh, Department of Education actually can be helpful <laughs> upon occasion, I found. Uh, but those days may be gone, I don't know. So it, what's going on now is just, is just ridiculous, and it's a reflection of the of the divide in the country, and uh, you know, it's 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 just a shame. By the way, after a couple more questions, Karen and her team are going to roll in some refreshments. So um, bear with us for a little bit longer, and you can have something to drink, right? Right. Um, behind the post. Yeah. Well, before that, uh, speaking. <laughs> Left Speaking of gray hair, I, I just, everybody's been doing their hand up since 1978. <laughs> <laughs> and she's got gray hair too, but I'm going to give my gray hair story, which is that uh, Craig Anderig and I started working together in 1969 uh, when I am a junior punk in the Nixon White House and he is on education and he is executive assistant to the U.S. Commissioner of Education, Jim Allen. Um, and it led to a, 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 a long lasting friendship and he was a wonderful guy. And I'm correspond with his, with his widow. All right, your turn. Thank you. Um, my name's Natalie Wexler, and I wanted to return to the question of the achievement gap. Um, 
And I've read reports that not only has it not narrowed, but in the last decade or so, it's actually widened. Massachusetts or more generally? Oh, uh, Massachusetts. Okay. And maybe that's not on the NAEP. Maybe that's on the state tests. But um, I just I wanted to sort of probe the reasons for that. And I suspect that one explanation is probably that Massachusetts has a large proportion of highly educated people, as D.C. does, and that pushes the top end of the gap upwards. But, um, but I had another question, another theory. Um, so one line of argument is that to really narrow the achievement gap, you have to start very young. You have to start at preschool, but really also the early elementary grades. And um, I'm actually, and that what is being done in a lot of early elementary classrooms is just skills-focused education rather than providing kids from less educated families with the kind of knowledge and vocabulary that children from more educated families are acquiring at home. Um, and I, in the course of researching a book that I'm currently working on on this topic, I've talked to a, a couple of people who are familiar with what's going on, at least in the Boston public schools, including their director of early education. And what I was told was that the curriculum framework, the standards, when you're talking about, and I'm not just talking about preschool, I'm talking kindergarten through second or third grade, that it's... Um, the curriculum frameworks don't, don't really reach that, that grade level. You're not able to test outcomes at that grade level. And so what really is needed is uh, guidance to school districts and schools in what a high quality curriculum looks like in the early grades and also training in how to implement that curriculum. And I've heard... This is turning into a question for them? It is. Um, I, heard, a question. I heard that there was um, some legislation designed to get the state to provide that kind of guidance, maybe along the lines of New York and Louisiana. And I'm just wondering, you mentioned trying to improve early education. So I'm just wondering if that's the kind of thing you're trying to do. Uh, so, yeah. um, so I don't know what the legislation is. And that doesn't mean it's, that doesn't exist, but oh, OK. Um, so we're, not, uh, we're definitely not uh, moving towards the development of curriculum, but we are trying to more actively get involved in the development of uh, 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 the sharing of units and the um, identification of resources that teachers can, can use uh, more and more often. Uh, I do think there, is, there needs to be a shift in the way in which we think about reading. And I think this is ha certainly happening in the literature. I'm not sure how much of it is um, sort of uh, uh, getting down into the classroom, which really is around the importance of both vocabulary and content in terms of being making it possible for young children and going into young adults to be able to read with, with real comprehension. Because we're asking them, we're, we're definitely raising the expectations for their comprehension. Um, but I think you, you're right, the, pedag the pedagogical approach is still far too skill-oriented. And to some extent, we have probably cut back. And I know some of, them, some of the folks will blame this on, on testing. Uh, I'm not sure I buy that. But that, that some of the curriculum around history, social science, and the sciences in particular have been scaled back or have been watered down. And as a result, we're actually undermining our reading skills. So I, I, I totally accept the, the point that you're making from a, a pedagogical or instructional point of view. Uh, we are sort of nudging, I would say, the system in this way. But I would also say not all that directly or probably all that effectively. One, one of the legacies of No Child Left Behind, which has been picked up in ESSA, is the notion that you don't start actually assessing uh, reading until the end of third grade. Um, and uh, that means we actually, a, at the state level, national level, know very little about what's being learned about reading in kindergarten one and two. Uh, individual teachers may know, individual schools may know, maybe individual districts know. Um, but I don't think we have any good systematic data even on this. And uh, I think we're stuck with it, partly because with the testing backlash that is um, with us, we're not going to impose any more. Other questions? Uh, oh, goodness, three, I think. Uh, and then we're going to quit and have a drink. Uh, one, two, three. Thank you. Hi, uh, Peggy Siegel. Uh, you've mentioned the, the pivotal role of the business community as a supportive partner in education reform. And I'm wondering, um, piggybacking on Susan's question about innovation, is there a role or is the business community playing a role beyond just technology, beyond funding like Gates Foundation or everybody else, 
but um, capturing how innovation is implemented and then sharing it as a resource to leaders and others in education. And could that be something that could spark more of a, uh, a breakthrough opportunity in, in, Massachusetts, in Massachusetts and elsewhere? today. Thank you. Anyone have a thought on that? Me? All right. <laughs> Mr. Massachusetts. Uh, I, I guess I'd say it's, it's pretty limited. Um, no. Again, there we have innovation and entrepreneurship uh, happening all around us, and it doesn't necessarily seep into, into schools and classrooms. Uh, and, and for all this, the reasons that have historically, I think, made it difficult for businesses to engage productively or deeply with schools, it's a little bit of apples and oranges, oil and water, I don't know. Um, and uh, to the extent that there are some insights into the way in which organizations run, in the way in which uh, human capital is developed, and the way in which innovation happens. Well, there are these, these lessons that certainly can be applied from business that can be applied, business and technology that can be applied into schools. There are, there are very different worlds, and, and it's very hard to, to make that translation happen. Again, I don't have an answer to it. I'd love to uh, listen to anyone who does. I, I'll just comment, Peggy, that um, I was very fortunate. I don't think they're as fortunate today. Uh, we have, they, they still have a lot of business support, but that business uh, is from the outside, if you will. In my day, uh, people that were heads of corporations, et cetera, were actually parents in the, in the district, from State Street to Federal Reserve Bank. So when I met with those people, they actually had kids in the schools. Uh, Jack Rennie, uh, who was our father of Ed Reform, used to work in schools. Uh, we had the business communities set up through Northeastern University, Reseed, which was uh, retired engineers that actually went in the classroom, and, and uh, Giannis Mavoulis uh, from the Museum of Science uh, uh, ran our palms program. He ultimately ended up uh, establishing robotics and, and a uh, technology, even though in New York, for example, and that's where it came from for us, our law says we'll test in mathematics, reading, social studies, science, and technology. Mm. So everybody saw, of course. Well, that technology was shop. That was a po that was a political play by the shop teachers. It was it was it was te technical. It was technology education, not educational technology. It was shop woodworking, right? And Giannis took that as so. I I was going to try to get a, a a change in the law, and, and they, it's in the book. And they said, please, you're not going to change the law. So Giannis actually brought the shop teachers in and said, look. We're going to use uh, the new shop, if you will, and that led to robotics and so on. And I think that's a big reason why we're second in the world in science at the eighth grade. We actually test those things uh, at, the, at the level. I don't think that, I, I think you still have good business support, Jim, it seems to me. People care about education in Massachusetts, but they're very cor it's very corporate now, and, it, and it's not the same uh, connection. Uh, we are making a, a pretty strong push to integrate computer science into the curriculum, and that may be actually a vehicle for some businesses or technology companies to engage in a way that feels more natural to them. Yes. Um, Roberta speak, Stanley. Speak into the mic. Thank you. Roberta Stanley, and it's a fellow State Department educational employee. Well, David, what's the most difficult decision you ever had to make Whoa. as the commissioner of Massachusetts? Excellent question. Well, I mean, there are, there are decisions, um, as you know, Brett, from, from your years in Michigan, uh, the, the most difficult personal decisions are to fire people or to lay them off if, if it's budget or uh, in other instances, that's, that's the toughest personal. Um, I think that the hardest for us uh, was to stick with it when uh, you start to lose the political support and, uh, you know, you, it looks as if it was at one point, uh, there was actually a bill passed in the legislature, passed the House, to delay MCAS, and so it looked as if we were going to have to come up with some kind of a compromise, and I knew that was a slippery slope. So th those are the things that uh, ma make it tough when it gets. Did you personally lobby the state legislators? Yes. To, to restore things yes. and get it back on track. Right. Exactly. See, a lot of educators are not either adept at that or inclined to do that. And our best state superintendents were those 
He did hands-on in the state budget. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not going to put it in the book, but there were issues that, uh, <laughs> there were times that, you know, we, we had to have a, a emergency meetings. Thanks. The book, the book we all want to read is the one you didn't want to write. <laughs> no, actually, actually, you, you may want to read the one that got cut out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I keep hearing about things I haven't put in, like Ann Duffy. Uh, I Googled, I think it's 70,000 words. They, they told me 70,000 words. Well, what I know? So I Googled words per page, right? And so I got on my little uh, laptop, and I did so many pages, and I, and I'd say, oh, so many pages, so many, you know, I'm a math guy, so many, I get some, so I, d I did seventy thousand words. So I sent one of the chapters to my editor, and she said to me, well, it's fine, but it's super long. And I said, really, super long? It's within the guidelines. She said, no, it's twice the guidelines. I was using a single spaced <laughs> program as opposed to double spaced. <laughs> So I actually read 140,000 words, and 70,000 of them got There is another book. We just can't read it. Uh, and uh, my, well, a person that helped me near the end said, why well, don't I write that second book? Because they cut out stories that are terrific. They didn't connect in, but they're great stories. <laughs> <laughs> there was one more question. You. Uh, Mike's coming to you. Good question. Well, as I say in the book, the Common Core state status was a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, there are, I, I'm going to say, 15 states that adopted the Common Core state standards within a very short time after they came out. And then after a, a while, it became you know, politically toxic, particularly when the Secretary Duncan made it a condition of race to the top, and, and there was a backlash, and, and then there were you know, people all over the country that came out against the Common Core state standards and called it all kinds of things. It was communism. It was terrible. And the one thing those, all those people had in common, they never read them. <laughs> they, are, they are words on a page. They are, I mean, really. I mean, pick up the Common Core state standards if you haven't done it and read them. I mean, th th there's not much there to get excited about one way or another, other than if you're a... Uh, you know, you're a standards person, they get excited about uh, <laughs> <laughs> the fact that we're doing uh, quadratic equations uh, earlier than they used to or something. Um, so I was much ado about nothing. Uh, the Common Core State Standards, as best I can determine, were, were a very pretty good uh, set of standards. The rest was all politics. So what's happened? Um, state after state rejected them. You know, the governor of Louisiana was going to run to pre for president, so he had to be against them. Um, in fact, the current president got some points for being against them. I'm sure he didn't read them. So, read? Uh, read, 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 read. So, uh, so it, it really, uh, so what you've seen, state after state after state, the Buckeye standards, the, the Hoosier standards, the whatever, they're all uh, common score state standards sort of sideways or something. Yes. So, uh, I think it's actually may come out at a pretty good place. If we could ever get the assessment established, Did and there, like uh, say that again? Like well, Massachusetts did it very well, and, and uh, it, they did a study. I think, Jim, you had just come in as secretary, I think, at the time, if I'm not mistaken. So they commissioned Westhead to do a side-by-side -side study of the, of the new standards that were being developed in Massachusetts with the Common Core State Standards. And, and found the Common Core of State standards to be acceptable, et cetera. There have been some changes, uh, I think probably minor in nature. So I think it's time to get on with it. Uh, I, I think there are pretty good states, there are much better state standards uh, around the country. This should have happened, in my judgment, the year after we led the country. Every state should have said, hey, let's, go, uh, let's look at Massachusetts standards and try to emulate them. Uh, but now it's, whatever, a decade later. So I, I think it may come out in the end. I'm very worried about the assessment, though, because that's all over them. Some people use ACT, and then there's all kinds of vendors. And, and, and that's okay as long as they, c it eventually it'll come out, and then we can compare it to NAEP, and then we'll be telling the truth to the country. I should say that in the works at Fordham, though it's still early days, is an updated review of state standards in reading and math. Uh, to take account of all of these shifts. And you'll have to wait a few months to see that review, but it's, uh, it's, 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 um, it's coming along. I think your assessment point is very important. Um, I, part, common co co comparability across states was supposed to be part of the point of both Common Core and then the common assessments. Um, can, I, can I make one last comment yeah. that I think was, 
You know, I have my last chapters if I close my eyes and open them five years from now. And I go into some things. I try to get into this red-blue political nonsense. But I, I think one of the key issues, I hope, in the future will be the emergence of, let's get the standards right and let's get the assessments right, but then let's develop formative assessments, not summative assessments. If summative assessments are fine, you've got to use them every now and then. But the for, a more formative assessment. And there are ways to tie the formative assessments in so that they're consistent. And I think then, because a formative assessment the teacher can use tomorrow, uh, they can't do much with the MCAS results when they get them in... Uh, you know, August, uh, and the new class is coming in or something. So I think that would be, it's this whole system. For some reason, we can't go logically. Uh, standards, good standards, honest standards. People go lying across the country, and David's right in New York, uh, uh, unfortunately, as well. Get the assessments pretty right, then start to work on how do we uh, develop tools to help people which would get us to a formative assessment, then we really would have a system that we're telling the truth. And it's not about, it's what kids need to know, and then we can focus on getting them there, including the kids in Boston who are in the kindergarten, first grade, et cetera. But now we're just fooling around, and, and we, we like the chaos because then nobody can hold us accountable. That's right, exactly. That's a pretty good benediction, I think. I think uh, Thomas Jefferson should be at least a little bit envious. I think this was a terrific, uh, uh, terrific panel, and I, uh, join me in thanking them all, please. And do get and read the book. It is worth it. And, uh, oh, so let me just say, because I got to do it. Go to the Harvard Education Press. You can go to Amazon, too, if you pay me. Go to the Harvard Education Press uh, card. Put in CACS, which is Commitment and Common Sense, CACS 17, and you'll get, you'll get uh, six bucks knocked off. Thank you very much. And there are always two high prices at the Harvard Education Press. That's yes, we've all lived with that. That's your call. We've That's all lived right. with that. Um, okay, uh, food's out, uh, wine's out. Uh, help yourselves, stick around, and thanks for coming. Thank you.